someone sent an email and they said, we've been studying Melchizedek uh, all summer or in, in the uh, home groups. Uh, of course, I've been in 12 by 12 and I haven't been in that, but I do know um, John MacArthur's study on Hebrews. And they said, could you relate Melchizedek to us non-Jewish people? Why there's so much space? I mean, a whole chapter, uh, you know, Hebrews 7 given to him. So we'll talk about Melchizedek. Here. Melchizedek is only three times in the Bible. And uh, I guess they ask, why is it so important for us non-Jewish people to know about Melchizedek? So uh, whenever you're studying uh, any topic in the scriptures, uh, I mean, you just you do an, an analysis and kind of take apart the scriptures, and you find that Melchizedek is only in three places in the scripture: uh, Genesis 14, Psalm 110, and Hebrews 7. Now, immediately, my mind starts thinking about this. Genesis 14, that's with Abraham, was about 2000 BC. Psalm 110, as David wrote it, was about 1000 BC. And Hebrews 7 is, you know, sometime before the destruction of Jerusalem, so somewhere in the 60s A.D. So we're talking about one person that's talked about over a 2,000-plus year, almost 2,100-year period of time in three different scriptures, and, and you start saying, why would God in Hebrews 7 say so much about this this very mysterious figure. So for just a second, we won't go very long. Look at Genesis 14 with me, and let's look at Melchizedek. And uh, I'll just tell you, basically, there, there are three views of who Melchizedek is. Um, one is that he's kind of like a good guy, Balaam. If you remember, Balaam in um, Exodus 32 to 34 is the one that, well, we're going to see him in the church in Pergamos. But he was the prophet for hire, and, and, but he knew God, and he knew the true and living God, and he communicated with God, and he knew God's name, he knew how to be in touch with God, but he was a bad guy. Well, Melchizedek in Genesis 14 also knows God. He knows him very well. In fact, he knows him and calls him by his name that, that is one of his great names, you know, the, the God Most High. But, but look, you know, the, the whole battle of uh, the kings uh, taking Lot, and, and all that, and Abraham um, pursuing him, verse 14, as far as Dan. But this is where it gets interesting in verse 18, Genesis 14, 18. Then, out of the blue, nowhere before mentioned, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of, and there's that El Elyon name of God, God Most High. Now, you remember every time a demon gets all fired up in the presence of Christ. Do you remember what they say? We know who you are. You're, and they'll either use this title or another title. They'll call you the Holy One of God or you are the, the one of the Most High God. This, this seems to be a spirit world well-known title that, that, that the Lord is the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, verse 19, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, and it's, now it describes this name of God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, that's Abraham, verse 20 at the end, gave him, that's Melchizedek, a tithe of all. Now that, that is very interesting. Now the kings of Sodom said to Abraham, Abram, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of, of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and I will take nothing but a thread, uh, nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, that I will not take anything as yours, lest you should say I've made Abraham rich and accept only what the young men. And he finishes off saying, you know, I don't want anybody to think that you helped Abraham, God most high did. I mean, that is a not a lot of stuff. And from that first mention of both Jerusalem and Melchizedek, we have in Psalm 110, the Lord saying, uh, I swear that you're going to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who was Melchizedek? That's the question. Why would, would this happen? And then the whole, turn over to chapter 7 of Hebrews, look at what it's talking about in Hebrews 7. And those of you, this is familiar ground if you're in our home groups. For Melchizedek, 7-1, he, 
king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all. By the way, you want to know something that's a little unnerving for all the you know, people that say we're not under the law, we don't tithe? This is before the law. Isn't that interesting? Moses didn't invent tithing. Abraham, to show honor to God before there was any Mosaic law, no diet, no Sabbath day, nothing. Moses wrote all that down. But this concept was, was known before that, to honor God, you give him the tenth. And so I always remember uh, when I was talking with John MacArthur about this, when I was starting out, a newlywed, you know, struggling to live in Los Angeles as expensive as it was, and I said, John, what do you do? And he says, I don't want to be a legalist. He said, I don't ever want any legalism, so I never give 10%. He said, I give 11 you know what the average American gives? The average church-going evangelical American? 1%. And they think that's huge for God. As long as we're on tithing, whoever asked this question, thanks for asking it. I've been waiting for a long time to talk about this. <laughs> it's not like 10% belongs to God and I get the other 90%. It's like 100% belongs to God. And my goal in life is not to see how much of the money God has richly given me I can spend, but how much I can put at his disposal. And to think of leveraging every dime so that I can have the largest home and the newest car is a very ungodly, unbiblical thought. It's American, but it's not biblical. The, the goal is not how much we can amass it's how much we can sacrificially show the lordship of Christ over in our lives. So thanks, whoever stuck this uh, uh, you know, under my door to get me started on that. But let's get back to Melchizedek. Who was he? Well, basically, he, if you're in the study, you know that, that he uh, is a contrast. We have the Aaronic priesthood, uh, and we have the Melchizedekian priesthood. And if you know anything about Aaron, it was hereditary. Uh, you could just... Uh, hereditary. You could just be a priest as long as you're in the right family. And as you know, there were some rascals, and there were some good ones. And uh, there were drunken children of, of uh, Aaron that got burned up by the Lord and other things. So, and then we'll come to that with the Christian and alcohol. Uh, but with Melchizedek, it, it was very personal. It shows that God picked him. Um, another thing about the Aaronic priesthood was these were just men, um, and, and basically, uh, that were dying. You know, we all are, are dying. Melchizedek is described as having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Uh, he, he is pictured as being timeless. Um, and, and, you know, there's, so, I mean, you're doing this in the study. You can do this. But what Melchizedek is, is, it is um, a picture of what Christ will do. Like, the Aaronic only dealt with Israel. I mean, they were only priests for the nation of Israel. Melchizedek is a priest that the kings of Sodom are recognizing, that Abraham, the, the one from Ur of the Chaldees, is talking to long before there was an Israel. And so he is... Uh, what we could call global or, or international or whatever. It's a worldwide priesthood. Um, and so why Melchizedek is so important is he becomes what we call a type um, of Christ, that, that Christ would be a personal priest, that, that he is an eternal priest. That's what the whole goal of, of Hebrews 7 is. He has a, a, a never-ending priesthood that saves us to the uttermost. And he isn't just saving the Jews, even though Jesus said salvation is of the Jews, but he's also so loved the world. And so you can do the rest of the study, but I still haven't answered who was he. And so uh, there are three views of that, and I will just briefly tell you what they are, and I'll tell you the one I like. Um, Melchizedek could be one of three things. Either he could be a good Balaam. In other words, uh, some pagan that came to know the Lord and, um, and knew access. So he was kind of like a good 
priest um, that knew God, but predates, predates any uh, revelation that's written down. And that's a view of some. We still don't know where Balaam came from. Balaam, Balaam knew how to get directly in touch with God, which few people in the Bible knew. So Balaam is a, a mystery. The one thing about Balaam, though, is Balaam wanted to, by his own words, he says, let me die the death of the righteous. He says that. But you know what? He didn't want to live the life of the righteous. And so Balaam is forever a picture of someone that's talk but didn't possess. That, that he talked about God. Uh, God was near in his mouth but far in his heart. And as far as we know, uh, Balaam is going to be suffering the blackness of darkness forever, eternal perdition, because he wanted to die the death of the righteous without living the life of the righteous. In other words, a life of faith. But So he was a good priest. Number two, uh, some say that he was a theophany, Melchizedek was, theophany, if you ever heard of that word, theo, uh, means God, phanos is in a bodily form, or a Christophany, um, which is the same idea, Christos, Christ, in a body. Um, a pre-incarnate um, visitation of Christ. And the reason they say that is because how could someone be the king of a Canaanite city like Salem and be godly? Because the Canaanites were so wicked. Remember Moses said the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet fully were. In fact, when they excavate around Israel, they hardly show the people what they find. It's so horrible, the Canaanite culture. They were baby murderers. I mean, they used to bury babies alive in jars. When they built something, they just put a living baby in there and seal it up and offer it to the gods. I mean, they were cold, cruel, heartless, murderous. Their perversion sexually is, is even makes Jewish archaeologists blush. They're so perverted, the Canaanites, as they excavate their stuff. And so people say the Canaanites are so bad, um, how could anybody but Christ be the king of Salem? Then there's a third view, which I think is very interesting, and that is, for everybody on earth, there would be three people that, as it says here, if you look back in verse 3 of Hebrews 7, without father, without mother, without genealogies, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. This would be someone that just kind of like they couldn't figure out. Like he lived longer than everybody else. Seems like he wasn't going to die. And he, he kind of was old when people just started coming around. And it's like, like he's from somewhere else. And there is, there, there is someone like that. And his name is Shem if you think about it. Because Noah had three sons, and those three were 100 years old when they stepped off the ark, so they were already old. But after the ark, after the flood of Noah, people began living normal, basic lifespans. A little elongated, but not really anything. And Shem lived 500 plus years, if you read what it says in Genesis 11. And so here's what I mean. Shem lived 400 years after the flood. That means that Shem would have been around for about 100 and, 100 and lots, 100 plus years, I don't have my chronology in front of me, of Abraham's life. So Shem easily could have lived in Jerusalem. Why? Because Japheth lived in Joppa. You know, you remember Shem, Ham, and Japheth? Do you remember what they did? If this is the ark, Japheth went down to Joppa and his family became what we call the Europeans. Those are the Japhitic tribes. Uh, and if you're ever interested in this, there's a guy named uh, Bill, mm -hmm. Bill, I'll think of it in a second. He spent his whole lifetime, he's a British guy, um, he spent his whole lifetime studying the table of nations that's in Genesis 10. Genesis 10 says that from the ark overspread the earth 70 families, and it names every family. 
And it, it gives a specific name, you know, the Mizraim and the uh, Kethraim and the Luddites and blah, 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 all these, you know, 70 names. And Japheth's family, Ham's family, they went south. They became the equatorial people, the hot country people. They became, you know, Africa, the coastal areas, and, and Ham's descendants. Some of them actually went a little north and became the Canaanites. And if you remember, that's who Noah cursed. Then there's Shem. And Shem is the Semitic peoples, the people of the Middle East. Abraham was a descendant. So it's very possible that Shem is one of the, I mean, Shem fits with the good priest and the theophany thing quite well, because all of them we don't know. But it's very interesting that if you do the chronology, it appears that Shem died the same year as the 127-year-old Sarah died. And so if you know anything about Abraham's life, he must have really mourned that year because he lost possibly this person that knew God from before the flood and told him about you know Noah and Noah would have known all the way back I mean through his relatives would have known and heard of Adam and so this touch all the way to creation Shem would have brought all the way here to Abraham's life but um, this this book that's written is fascinating because this man, Bill, whatever his name is, um, his book is called After the Flood. That's the title of it, After the Flood. And if you're one of these people who likes to read intriguing stuff, he spent 30 years of his life systematically going through the archives of Denmark, of Scotland, of England, of Germany, of Italy, of Spain, and then he went to the Middle East, and he went through Turkey's and Syria's, and you know he spent and, and he finished this book in the I think in the 70s, and uh, it used to be sold by uh, Institute of Creation Research because it's so fascinating. What he found is every one of the 70 families that are listed in Genesis 10, every one of them you can find in the royal archives of these countries exactly spelled the same. Now these people don't study the Bible, they don't even believe the Bible, and they don't even care what's in their archives, but the earth is not as old, and that will get up to uh, uh, this question here. The earth is not as old as a lot of people think, because Shem most likely knew Abraham, Shem's dad most likely had first-hand accounts of Adam. And it's very possible Shem was Melchizedek because he would have known the Lord. And he would have appeared to be, verse 3, he would have appeared to be without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of life nor end of days, but made like the Son of God. So that's a possibility. Uh, probably the one that, that most theologians favor would be this middle one. Um, and then others are here, and others are here. But that's why Melchizedek is here, to show the type of the perfection of Christ's priesthood. But who he was, this gives you an example of what theologians do when they have very little to work with. Genesis 14 is only that long. But if you do the math, and there's no reason to believe that the Bible means anything other than it says, that Shem lived after the flood, uh, about 400 years, and so he would have been synonym or contemporary with Abraham.